Welcome to the podcast for topic 4.1, Technological Innovations. Our essential question, how did cross-cultural interactions spread technology and facilitate changes in trade and travel from 1450 to 1750? Kind of a summary of this topic, what we're looking at here in your notes. Underline this. Inventions allowed Europeans to venture long distances on the ocean. They are no longer restricted to being land-based empires only. So it doesn't mean they stop being land-based empires. In addition to being a land-based empire, they're going to become uh, maritime traders. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. So I'm going to give you five, uh, I think, was it four or five? I'm going to give you four specific inventions that contributed to this. Now, in history, unfortunately, it's not like math. In math, 10 times 10 is 100. You're not going to sit around and debate that, right? History, especially when it comes to who invented what, depending who's in the room with you, you're going to get maybe some uh, some blowback and some disagreement. Because sometimes things are invented in one country, then maybe they're modified by another culture, then maybe they're improved by another culture, but everybody will claim, no, no, we invented that. So you got to take that with a grain of salt. I was using uh, my Briki to make my Greek coffee that uh, my friend Nick gave me back in 1986 in Greek town in Detroit, downtown Detroit, and... Uh, I love Greek coffee, even though I'm not Greek, and I've made it every morning, and I still do. Well, I had friends over one time, and I'm making my Greek coffee, and an Arabic friend of mine says, oh, you're making Arabic fo- coffee. Then uh, some family, some Italian Maltese, they go, that's Italian coffee. So they see the Briki, they, and they call it something different, of course, but they see that process as something from their culture that their country invented. And we're not going to get that deep into the weeds where we're going to investigate that kind of stuff, right? It's a survey class. But just keep that in mind when you're talking about an invention and where it came from or who invented it. Sometimes we're talking about who invented it. Sometimes we're talking about who modified it. Sometimes we're talking about who made it better and who made it the most you know, practical. Okay, so the first one, the magnetic compass originally is created in China But it wasn't used to find out if you're going north or south. It was used for fortune telling, which probably wasn't very effective, right? Um, The magnetic compass, the real value of this invention is going to be, it's going to help steer a ship in the right direction. Right now, in your generation with smarty phones and Google machines, that may not sound like much. But imagine you're on a boat. You leave your uh, your parents' lake house and you're sitting in the middle of a lake and you know you have to travel south. You don't know which way is south. So you got a 25% chance of guessing right. That's right? no good. So this compass was incredibly impactful for north and south. The north and south pole um, helped make this uh, invention very useful. Okay, the second one, the astrolabe. This is improved by Muslim navigators in the 12th century. What it did is it let sailors find out how far north or south they were from the equator. If you uh, Google that up, you can see a picture of an astrolabe. Probably be a good idea or look in your book. Okay, the caravel. This is our third invention that we're talking about. So please keep your notes organized. Number these things. Um, The Caravel, this is a small three-masted sailing ship developed by the Portuguese in the 15th century. It's more durable and it's safer than previous ships. So it's not like it's the first ship. It's just it's more durable and it's safer. And it could carry more. Okay, uh, the fourth invention is cartography. This is map making. Crucial for... uh, You know, if voyagers have more confidence in where they're going and how they're going to get there, um, you can trade more, you can trade faster, and everybody can make more money. Okay, so those are four inventions. Okay, draw a line in your notes. Let's go to a different topic. 
I'm going to ask you a question. What was a major cause of European exploration and trade? A major cause at this time was demographic pressures. What does that mean? I'm not making any money where I'm at. I don't like my life where I'm at. I want to go somewhere else. I heard I can make more money over there. I heard things are flourishing over there. One reason, but not the only reason, and this is a big term that uh, the college board wants you to know. Uh, primogeniture, I hope I'm saying that right, primogeniture uh, laws. These laws said that the eldest son is going to inherit the family wealth. So it leaves his other siblings kind of out in the dark. What was the purpose of these laws? The idea is economic. Uh, it's that, say you have five kids, you know, and you worked hard to build your family wealth. You inherited some wealth from your father. He inherited some from your grandfather. The idea is that you build on it, you build on it, you build on it. You got five kids, you split it up five ways. Statistically speaking, a couple of those kids are going to be knuckleheads. They're not going to be financially literate, and they're going to blow the money. And you're not going to have a consolidated family wealth. So it's kind of keep the wealth consolidated in one person's hands. The idea was it has a better chance of surviving and growing, right? And that way, you know your oldest son, you want to make sure as you're raising this kid that he understands financial literacy and responsibility, and he's not going to uh, squander the family fortune. However, not everybody had a family fortune, right? So this isn't the only reason. Um, Some people that came from families with no wealth to inherit, they want to do better. They want to start, right? Somebody has to break that cycle, right? So they want to start having some family wealth. So they're looking to get out for opportunity. Um, Even though money is a huge incentive, it's not the only one. Religious minorities, they're looking to go somewhere where they can find some sense of tolerance from the, you know, whatever the majority culture is. Somewhere where they're going to be treated, you know, hopefully as equals if, you know, at the very least, not treated like second-class citizens. So they're looking somewhere where they can live in somewhat, you know, some peace and um, be left to, uh, you know, carve out their own life for themselves and their family. This is going to cause a global shift in demographics. People that were traditionally in one spot are going to start being spread all over the world. People want upward mobility. People want opportunity. And all human beings are incentive-based then and now. That's their incentive. So draw a line in your notes. We're going to go to the next topic. The Omani european Rivalry. O-M-A-N-I-European Rivalry. This is a rivalry between the Omani and the Europeans in the Indian Ocean. So we're in the Indian Ocean. So look at a map. You'll see... uh, the east coast of Africa, you'll see uh, the southern tip of India, you'll see the uh, western coast of Australia, the Indian Ocean. This rivalry, right, why are they rivals, right? Trade routes, money, who controls what? Side note, this is one reason that Columbus wants to find a new route to India to avoid all this mess. And... Again, sometimes necessity, when people do something out of necessity, it could, you know, change world history. And Columbus, I'm no fan of Columbus, but what he does is changes world history, right? The voyages of Columbus, we're not going to get into all that. Uh, if you want to learn more about him, you know, I know it's a very controversial topic. Uh, but, you know, I, I would advise you to read, you know, Maybe a more traditional, conservative uh, book on Columbus. And then I would advise you to read The People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn. And uh, see the primary documents that that's based on. You're not going to find that uh, those stories from Columbus in too many places. You're not going to see it in your U.S. history textbook. But the idea is you make up your own mind. You know, No teacher should tell you what to think or how to think. Our job is to get you to think, 
right? So we we can't get sidetracked on the Columbus thing for too long, but uh, check you know check that out and uh, form your own opinion. But regardless of your opinion on Columbus, a historical fact is that his voyages connected people across the Atlantic Ocean. And again, we're studying world history thematically. Um, that's how the College Board, the Course and Exam Description, um, has it set up. European traders became go-betweens, linking Afro-Eurasia and the Americas. So this is huge. Um, you know, how did a horse get to North America, uh, you know, the Western Hemisphere, right? Um, how did corn get back to Europe? Okay, so some of the things they got from different parts of the world. From the Americas, Europe's getting sugar, tobacco, and rum. From Africa, unfortunately, they're obtaining enslaved people. And they say all throughout human history, one of the most horrible experiences human beings ever had to go through. One of the last things you'd ever want to be. Just absolute horrible. They said, hell on earth was being an African slave being transported on a slave ship. Uh, probably the one of the best reenactments of that. It would just it'll just tear your soul out. Uh, run a movie called Amistad, and that'll that'll give you a sense of what it was like. Much better than a textbook or a teacher telling you about it. So anyway, okay, from Asia they obtained silk, spices, and rhubarb. Rhubarb pie. I'm not really a fan. Anyway. This extensive trade transformed Spain, Portugal, Great Britain, France, and Holland into maritime empires. So that's a big term for the college board, maritime empires. All that means is these are empires that are based on sea travel, right? And to break it down a little bit more, just make sure we're on the same page. Don't let this, you're going to hear maritime over and over and over again. It's all over this portion of the curriculum. Don't let that word go by you a hundred times and you really don't know what it means. Make sure you know. So according to Doc Webster, maritime, the definition is of, relating to, or bordering on the sea. So make sure you know what maritime means. So draw a line in your notes. Here's a new topic, classical, Islamic, and Asian technology. Western European countries such as Portugal, Spain, and England were developing their naval technologies. Now, as the title says, that I just read to you, the classical portion, they have the knowledge of traditional sailing that went back to, uh, to ancient Greece. And... The new Islamic and Asian technology that they were exposed to because of cross-cultural interactions that were resulting from these trade networks, this enabled them to improve and combine their, um, their knowledge and technologies. Now, this, you got to take this with a grain of salt, too. I don't know, but I think this guy, I think this guy was more sizzle than steak, but the leading European figure in this development was Portuguese ruler, Prince Henry the Navigator. This guy's going to come up a lot. However, his name may not have been very well earned. This guy never actually went on, you know, on a long expedition or exploring or a long sea voyage. As a matter of fact, when he was on a ship, he never went so far as to lose sight of land. So when he was about to lose sight of the land, he turned back. So he, but I, he became a little more, uh, I think his real impact and influence. There's a couple things historians would tell you. He finances a lot of expeditions. Right, he's the money guy. He's he's the 
you know, he's like the silent part of the, the financier. And he finances expeditions along Africa's Atlantic coast and around the Cape of uh, Good Hope. Now, the Cape of Good Hope, just a proactive approach to a common mistake. Uh, Cape of Good Hope is on a peninsula just under Cape Town, uh, as far as geography goes. Um, with his backing, Portugal explored African coastal communities and kingdoms before other European powers. It was more his financial backing uh, than him actually doing it. His his name's pretty misleading. It's a misnomer. Um, one thing he did is he sent a couple guys, uh, a couple of his captains, to the west coast of Africa. And uh, they, they came across black Muslims dressed in white robes and turbans. And they were looking for gold. And they end up just getting a little bit of gold dust. And um, the Portuguese, they seized, I think nowadays you would call that kidnapping, but they seized 12 black Africans to take back to Portugal. Not as slaves, but they were like uh, exhibits to show Prince Henry. These were not Portugal's first slaves, but one of the people that they took was a ch local chief when he spoke Arabic. The chief ends up negotiating his own release, and the terms were that if he and a boy from his family were taken back to their homeland and released, they would provide other black slaves in exchange for their freedom. So the Portuguese explorers are going to end around 1442. The Portuguese are going to return from Africa, and that's going to be about 30 slaves. Within a decade of that, which was circa 1442, thousands of slaves are going to be transported by sea to Portugal and the Portuguese islands. So this, for better or for worse, is... Uh, one of uh, his accomplishments here. Another reason he kind of gets that name, Prince Henry the Navigator, after he dies, he, he's like 66 years old and he dies. After he dies, uh, the progress in the Portuguese exploration just explodes. Um, and people are making a lot of money. And the Portuguese trade routes, exploration, it's just booming. So it was kind of like a tip to the cap. So you know who got the ball rolling here was, you know, Prince Henry. So, you know, uh, interesting character, often uh, misinterpreted. And what's also misinterpreted, again, is that that Cape of Good Hope, the reason I mentioned it, it gets misinterpreted at like like it's the southern tip of South Africa. Not quite. It's under a, a peninsula under Cape Town. If you, you could Google map that. Uh, Cape Agullis is the southern tip of South Africa. That's the southern tip, not uh, Cape of Good Hope. Anyway, draw a line. Let's get another topic. Let's talk about advances in ideas, right? Don't underestimate the value of ideas. A lot of these inventions, they come from an idea. So here's an idea in advance. Number one, Newton's discovery of gravitation increases knowledge of the tides. And again, Isaac Newton, we could make 20 podcasts on Isaac Newton and his work, but that's not what we're here for, right? We're going topic to topic here. Um, number two, improvements... In cartography, map making. So we're getting better maps. Three, astronomical charts. Maps of the stars. The stars can guide um, people involved in maritime trade. And, you know, like I said at the beginning, I'm not saying uh, astronomical charts were invented right here and now. They went back as far as uh, the second millennium BCE. The thing is that they're being improved upon and they're becoming more valuable and practical and accurate 
to uh, people of this time. Okay, please draw a line in your notes. Let's go to a new topic. Underline this, advances in equipment. So I'm going to give you specific advances in equipment. Number one, there's a new type of rudder. New type, right? Uh, if you don't know what a rudder is, it helps you steer your ship. So the better you can steer it, the quicker you can steer it. You know, you see rocks, you see shallow waters, uh, another ship, whatever. You're trying to get away or attack. This helps tremendously. Uh, the Astrolabe is a second advancement in equipment. Again, it's improved by Muslim navigators in the 12th century. It told you how far north or south are you from the equator. Astrolabe. Okay, three, the compass. Uh, it's a primary direction finding device used in navigation. Magnets or gyroscopes, so they're not all magnetic. Now, I talked about how this was discovered by mariners in both China and Europe in the 12th century. But China was using it for uh, fortune telling. Uh, Earth's magnetic field is almost parallel to the north and south axis of the globe. So what does that mean? Right? And I got to be careful. I'm, uh, I got to stay in my lane. If I start talking about science, things can get sideways. But um, this means that freely moving magnets such as those in a compass take on the same orientation. So hopefully that makes sense. A fourth is the Latine sail. Now the Latine sail, if you look in your book or uh, use your Google machine, this is like a triangular sail. It was different than the square sails, but it wasn't just for aesthetic purposes. Um, it had a practical purpose. It was used by Arab sailors in the Indian Ocean. Unlike these traditional square sails, the Latin sails were triangular and they could catch the wind on either side of the ship. So it allowed the ship to travel in different directions. So you weren't just going where the you know wind blows, as they say. Um, when you combined it, when you used it with square sails, the Latin allowed sailors to travel successfully into larger bodies of water, including oceans for the first time. What does that do? That expands trade routes. So it's all connected. Access, mobility. Okay, and five. These new types of ships also improve trade. Builders are improving the ship's efficiency. Uh, they're adjusting the ratio of the length to the width of a ship. They're reducing the number of mass and they're using different sails. Okay, so that's five. So please draw a line in your notes and write down this question. What was the long-term result of combining navigational techniques invented in Europe with those from other areas of the world? The answer, well, the short answer, a rapid expansion of exploration and global trade. So that's what we've been talking about, but that's your big question and your big answer. Let's close this out with some other long-term results. So in your notes, put other long-term results from what we've talked about today. Gunpowder is helping Europeans conquer. That's pretty cut and dry. However, kind of it can backfire on them too, no pun intended. Sea pirates also gained access and possession of gunpowder. So People are using it against you too. Okay, so another long-term result. Islam is going to spread quickly in North Africa and all along the trading routes, all the way down the continent, along Africa's east coast. So where there's trade, you're also spreading religion. In this case, Islam. Another long-term result. Extensive trade. And new technology, which we specifically discussed today, were brought to Africa because of cultural interactions. Another long-term result. Navigational techniques continued to spread throughout the 17th century. So again, you see this continuity of 
exchanging religion and um, technology and these techniques. Another long-term result, Peter the Great, who was a czar of Russia, he's going to visit Western Europe in 1697, and he's going to observe military and naval technology. Peter the Great is known for his um, kind of admiration for the West. And Russia, and this is going to be true even when you go in the 20th century with Stalin, they're always worried about be, being too far behind, not up with the times, too agricultural, not industrial enough, you know, later on. Here, Peter the Great doesn't want Russia to be left behind, so he's trying to find out what, what do I need to do to keep up with the West? How are they doing it, right? And that's why he takes his travels to the West. Um, his interest in European technology is going to help him build Russia's military and naval power. Peter the Great does not want Russia to get left behind. Remember um, a while back, I forgot, Unit 3, you know, the, uh, the gunpowder empires. It might have been topic 3.1. The gunpowder empires, the Islamics, gunpowder empires kind of went down. But not Russia. Russia was that fourth gunpowder empire. So here he is again. You know, here's Russia again. Fighting to stay relevant. Fighting to stay modern. Okay, that closes it out. For topic 4.1. Hope you took good notes. Please study them. And please, please keep in mind. The podcast, the lectures, whatever they are. They're meant to complement the reading. They're not meant to replace the reading. Please make sure you're reading the book. All right, see you next time.